In this video, I want to tackle a special class of molecules called ionic liquids, and specifically a magnetic one. Ionic liquids are something I've seen come by in many papers, but I always thought they would be expensive and out of reach. So their true identity remained a mystery to me until I decided to look into them. Turns out they aren't expensive, they are quite simple to make and have great properties. The prime examples of ionic liquids are derivatives of the salt 1-butyl-3-methyl-imidazolium chloride, which is still a solid at room temperature. But strictly defined, ionic liquids are salts that are liquid below 100 C. Generally, the chloride ion is replaced with something else, like hexafluorophosphate, to make it fully liquid at room temperature and more of a real ionic liquid. There of course exist more ionic liquids. Generally, they are salts of alkylated tertiary amines, most often from imidazoles or pyridines with inorganic anions such as hexafluorophosphate and tetrafluoroborate. But organic anions can also be used. Ionic liquids are said to have many potential applications, but their use remains behind the promise. They are powerful solvents for a broad spectrum of molecules, inorganic, organic and polymeric, while being immiscible with many organic solvents. They can be used as electrolytes and for various types of battery applications. They have very low vapor pressure and can be considered non-volatile, meaning they are safe to work with in open spaces and aren't lost to the atmosphere. They are generally non-combustible and thermally stable, and they can be recycled indefinitely and also possess strong catalytic power for various reactions. That sounds great, so what is holding them back? Are chemists just slow and stupid? Well, yes. It usually takes decades for industry to implement new research, and people like to stay in old habits. But maybe they also aren't as good as they are made out to be. I have to investigate. So in this video, I'll be making one of the few magnetic ionic liquids, which is 1-butyl-3-methyl-imidazolium-tetrachloroferrate, because I want to see how it compares to ferrofluid. Later, I want to use this ionic liquid in another video, because of the properties of ionic liquids, unrelated to its magnetism. For the synthesis, I will start all the way at the beginning and construct my own 1-methyl-imidazole from simple reagents. So to get started with making 1-methyl-imidazole, I add 76 ml of 25% ammonia as the first reagent into a large flask with a stir bar. To this, I add 117 ml of a 39% solution of the reagent glyoxal, which reacts pretty much immediately with the ammonia to form the corresponding imine. Since it gets quite hot, I move it to an ice bath. I leave it to stir for 10 minutes and then add 86 ml of 40% methylamine to the mixture. It also reacts quickly and becomes cloudy from a precipitate forming. I let it stir for a few minutes and then gradually add 75 ml of 37% formaldehyde as the last reagent and I then flush it with nitrogen and allow it to stir overnight. In this reaction, ammonia, glyoxal, methylamine and formaldehyde all react together to form 1-methyl-imidazole. What exactly the mechanism of this reaction is, has not been confirmed. Using regular mechanism logic seemingly does not give something satisfying, as it forces you to draw unconventional reactions where the likelihood is difficult to judge, which requires experimental verification. The yield of the reaction in general seems to be relatively moderate in all cases. When it should be done, it has become a dark red solution, and I set it up for short path vacuum distillation to first remove all of the water. The product does not distill over with the water in any significant quantities, as basification followed by extraction does not yield more product, which I tested as well. When that's done, I swap the receiving flask, increase the temperature, and insulate the apparatus to start distilling over the formed 1-methyl-imidazole. After a while, it stops distilling, and what is left behind seems to be just some kind of high boiling point trash, so I discard it. The liquid I distilled over is also definitely not pure 1 methyl imidazole, as it also contains some unknown solid. Since only the imidazole should be capable of forming an ionic liquid, other trash in here is likely to separate out later anyway, so I will forward it as is. So to the distilled liquid, containing 1 methyl imidazole, I add an excess of the reagent 1 chlorobutane, and I heat it to a reflux for a day. In this reaction, 1 methyl imidazole reacts with 1 chlorobutane forming the ionic liquid 1-butyl-3-methyl-imidazolium chloride, also called BMIM-CL. This simply happens through nucleophilic attack of the imidazole amine onto the carbon adjacent to the chlorine of 1-chlorobutane, kicking off the chlorine, which stays around as a chloride counter-ion. After a day, it should be done, the mixture has turned red, 
and separate it into two layers. I simply set it up for short path vacuum distillation again to remove the excess chlorobutane first, giving a red liquid. I wash this with ethyl acetate like is done in literature sometimes, but it doesn't seem to help at all. BMIM CL should be solid at room temperature, but it's likely that the other crap is dissolving it. Either way, if it is in here, it will be the only compound that is capable of forming the magnetic ionic liquid BMIM tetrachloroferrate. So I can just add an excess of iron 3 chloride hydrate and allow it to react. And it should just separate out. I then also add some water to dissolve the excess and dissolve polar impurities that the ethyl acetate couldn't dissolve. Since the ionic liquid isn't so soluble in water, all of it separates out and gives the dark liquid BMIN tetrachloroferrate on the bottom, while all the excess and impurities are on top in the water layer. Holding a magnet by it makes it respond slightly. The attraction seems to be quite weak, but it is there. However, since the reactions were a bit trashy, I want to compare it by doing the reaction with commercial beam MCL and see if the degree of magnetism is the same and then try some more with that. So I bought commercial beam MCL, which isn't that expensive, and I add 20 grams of it to a flask. I then add one equivalent, which is 31 grams of iron 3 chloride hexahydrate directly on top. And I heat the flask under nitrogen to liquefy the beam MCL and speed up the reaction. When it's done, just like the first run, there's a dark liquid of the BMIM tetrachloroferrate on the bottom. On top is 6 equivalents of water from the hydrate. I will pipette the ionic liquid out and place some on a small dish to see its magnetism. Exactly like my self-made one, its magnetism is quite weak and it pulls around the magnet if I set it on top. Its magnetism is clear, but it is not at all like ferrofluid which responds to magnets very strongly. This is because BMIM tetrachloroferrate is paramagnetic, which is weak compared to the ferro or ferry magnetism from ferrofluids. Online, it says ferrofluids can, for example, have a magnetic susceptibility of 30 emu per gram, while BMIM tetrachloroferrate sits at 40.6 times 10 to the power minus 6 emu per gram. That makes it about 740,000 times less magnetic if my calculations are correct. Still, it is interesting that a true magnetic liquid exists, since ferrofluid is just a suspension of particles, which is part of colloid chemistry, which is part of the fake chemistry circle and should be banned from our science. It is also an obvious example of the weakness of paramagnetism and highlights that not all magnetism comes equal. Some paramagnetic materials are so weakly attracted that it requires sensitive equipment to even tell if they are. Luckily, in this case, we can see it with our own eyes. This ionic liquid isn't just interesting because of its magnetic properties, it also has interesting catalytic, conductive and solvation properties. It can supposedly be recycled indefinitely and they can sometimes be better solvents than regular solvents, while also catalyzing certain reactions which makes them very interesting for speciality applications and the chemical industry. Currently a few processes exist that use them, but progression is quite slow, so it still leaves to wonder maybe they aren't as good as they are made out to be, and I want to see that for myself. BMIM tetrachloroferrate, specifically, is seemingly a good catalyst for the selective depolymerization of lignin into vanillin, which I want to try it later and conclude if ionic liquids are truly as good as they are made out to be, or they're trash. Stay tuned, that was it, see ya.